solar energy has become highly politicized in the United States. Typically, those arguing against it claim that either the technology isn't quite there yet or that carbon resources won't be running out anytime soon. During my conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Landis, I learned that though both of these arguments are true, solar will be the energy source for humanity in just a few decades. I'm a little bit disappointed by how political it has become, but underneath that, Solar technology is development, it's real. It's under development, it's getting better, and you start seeing it all over. It used to be when I first got involved with the field, if you saw a solar array somewhere, you'd stop and say, wow, look, there it is, there's a solar array. And now you drive by solar arrays all the time. You drive by a construction site and the orange barrels have solar arrays on them. You drive by a billboard and there's a solar array underneath it. Yeah. You drive by just some buildings, industrial sites, and you see solar rays outside. It's real, it's happening, uh, it's here. Have we in the United States, because we, it's been, you know, become such an issue, are we really lagging behind where we could be or where we should be in your eyes? Well, most of the solar technology you see these days actually comes from the initiatives of the late 70s and early 80s, hmm. where there was some really very serious work done by the Department of Energy saying, well, let's take this technology out of the lab, let's make it practical, let's make it cheap. So all the technology, if you drive around and you see a, a solar cell maybe on a little garden light, that really comes out of the research funding that was done uh, in the early 80s. Uh, so it's American technology, but it's spread out to the whole world. So China is now making solar cells with the technology that we developed in America in the 1980s. But that's the way technology works doesn't stay in one place, it spreads out. Everybody gets it. What the Chinese have been doing in particular is focusing a lot on how do we make solar cells low cost. And they've been doing some really impressive work on that. I don't know if I'd call that antiquated technology, but they're focusing on something different than the types of technologies that I work on. Mm -hmm. Solar for spacecraft, where we're interested in how can we make it really highly efficient. But it, technology diffuses down. Uh, you start out making very highly efficient technologies for spacecraft, and then we get the ground applications, and people look at them and say, how can we make this, this cheaper? All the solar cells you see today are also, to some extent, the children of the solar panels that were made for spacecraft in the, the early days of the space race, because yeah. that was the first real big application for, for solar arrays. So I think the high efficiency technologies who work on the labs, eventually the, the laboratory stuff will come down into the, the consumer market and everybody will have it. As you said, a lot of the, our technology or the, the birth of the mm -hmm. solar technology was in, in uh, space applications. What projects did, did that really begin with? Well, it began with all of the satellites. Okay. Uh, when we were putting, first putting artificial satellites up, the first satellites that the U.S. put up, they said, well, what if we use these new things called solar cells uh, instead of just having a battery powering the satellite? So we said, okay, we'll put the Explorer satellite up, and it was, had a solar cell on it, and it worked far better than anybody anticipated. Yeah. The battery ran out after a week, but the solar cells kept working, and it kept broadcasting. Wow. Then the big application for satellites was we went and said, well, we do satellites for communications. Uh, and now we can have a direct radio link from Europe to America mm -hmm. uh, bounced off of a satellite. And the satellites, of course, had to be powered by something. So we started developing solar arrays for communication satellites. And these got bigger and bigger, uh, sort of pushing the, the technology and developing solar cells that were reliable and rugged and uh, you know, more and more efficient. Solar cells are getting to the point where they're very practical in the real world for applications where you need energy in the daytime mm -hmm. and you have a lot of sunlight. So you tend to see more of the big projects as you move a little bit further to the south where there's more sunlight, uh, the days are longer. Mm -hmm. The efficiencies that you're getting for terrestrial solar arrays, they probably come in about 15%. Okay. So out of all of the sunlight, the sunlight hitting the Earth is about a kilowatt a square meter, mm -hmm. thousand watts a square meter. 
you're converting about 15%. So you get about 150 watts a, a square meter out of a, a solar cell on a cloud-free day yeah. if it's facing into the sun. A little bit less here in Cleveland where it tends <laughs> to be cloudy, I'm afraid. How, how much uh, would you, if you had to estimate, would it, if, if it is in a, in a cloudier area, what do your um, efficiencies become then? Because I know that one of the largest places right now that solar work is being done is, is in Germany, mm -hmm. which uh, a lot of people are interested in because it is uh, so cloudy there. Your efficiency is still pretty good even if it's cloudy, but the amount of energy coming in gets to be lower. So you're still getting, you're still getting power conversion, uh, but you're just not getting as much out of the area. The Germans have been very interested in green technologies. They've mm -hmm. been saying, well, we've been living on the, the supply of coal and we can't do that forever. Yeah. What's the next thing? So they've been doing uh, feed-in tariffs. So they've been saying, well, we will pay money extra for making electricity out of green technologies like wind and solar. So they've really been pushing the commercialization of the technology. The, the Germans have, the Spaniards have. Uh, there's been some Japanese projects to just sort of see how we can push the technology, see how we can make it practical for worldwide use. The best solar cells we use in space, sort of the record efficiency is a little bit better than 30%. Okay. So it's about double what you get on just a commercial panel that you might buy in a, in a hardware store. Then they're pushing these technologies pretty, the progress has been pretty amazing. Uh, we've been making almost a 1% efficiency gain a year for the last uh, couple of years. Wow. Uh, and we're expecting that the next generation might be up in the 35% range. And the, the generation after that, if all the research goes well, will probably be up toward 40% with an ultimate goal of maybe 50% conversion efficiency. When could we expect those types of efficiency rates to drop down from the space-based level or, or, or governmental testing phase and drop down to where it would really be uh, applicable to, to contemporary life? That's a hard question. Right now, if you go out and you can buy at a utility level solar panels, you might pay about a dollar a watt. Okay. And by the watt, I mean a, a solar panel that would produce one watt if it's tilted flat into the sun at noon. If we're buying solar cells for satellites, that would be more like $500 a watt, maybe even as much as $1,000 a watt. Okay. So we pay a lot for the efficiency. Yeah. Everybody's interested in taking that technology and figure out how do we make it cheap? Mm -hmm. How do we take these very high efficient semiconductors and learn how to make them in huge areas for low cost? At the moment, that's still a ways off in the future. One of the techniques that people have been using is they're saying, well, if you have a solar cell that is $1,000 a watt, what if you just concentrate the sunlight by a factor of 1,000 on it? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can take even a very expensive solar cell, but it's only this big, yeah. and all of the price is in the concentrator. Yeah. So that's pretty good as long as you can use them in a place where you have a lot of direct sunlight. So you do have sunlight that you can concentrate on. So that's one of the approaches for lowering the very high cost of solar arrays for, for the high efficiency. There's a lot of people that are looking into what we call sort of the next generation concepts for mm -hmm. photovoltaics. One of them is these quantum dots. If you can make these very tiny little semiconductor dots, they get small enough that actually the quantum mechanical properties of the trapped electrons in the dots can allow you to shape the properties of the semiconductor so you can tune it to the solar spectrum. One of the reasons solar cells lose efficiency is because the solar cell will be of a material that's sort of optimized for one part of the solar spectrum, but the light in the solar spectrum is a, a wide spectrum. So if we have a technology we can sort of tune the dots for every part of the spectrum, we might be able to improve the efficiency even, even more. As of yet, that's mostly a technology we use in the lab. We haven't been making solar cells that have been breaking record efficiencies, but everything we learn is something that in the future we'll be able to perhaps turn into a device that we can uh, put out there in the market. I've heard people discussing this idea of solar paint, where you might be able to make solar cells that you can just paint on a building and make a whole side of a building a, a giant solar panel or paint on your roof. But I do know there's a lot of people looking at that idea, the idea that, well, 
you know, ultimately solar cells could be as cheap as paint. That would be, that would be impressive. Battery storage, if you're going into long-term use of electrical power, battery storage is going to be something that you're really going to have to work hard at developing. Right now, that's just about as difficult as making the power to start with. Mm -hmm. If we could improve battery technologies, and battery technologies are improving just as fast, maybe even faster than solar technology, there'd be a lot of things you can do. Right now, actually, generating power at night is cheap. Hmm. It's not a problem that solar doesn't make power at night because most of the power plants are idle at night anyway. So ramping them up just a little bit more to produce some power to, to fill in the night is not a big problem. In the long run, as we move to a regime where solar takes over most of our electrical power, we will have to learn how to store power with batteries to use it at night or else we'll have to move to a new lifestyle where we tend to use more power in the daytime and less power at night. I'm not sure that we have to use all that much power at night, mm. except for lighting, and lighting is only a small part of the power that we use. A lot of the electrical power we use goes for industrial uses, and we should be able to modify our, our way of life just a little bit in order to use power mostly in the daytime. So in the much longer term, the concept might be instead of putting solar panels on the ground where half of the day is night and sometimes it's cloudy, uh, you might be able to take solar panels and put them out in space above the atmosphere, above the clouds, and above the nighttime where the solar panels can generate power 24 hours a day, all the time. So this would be the most efficient use of the solar panels, mm -hmm. uh, but of course you do have the problem they'd be far away from the earth and how do you get the power down. The proposal has been that it's possible to beam power. So you can send power not over wires, but wirelessly, mm -hmm. perhaps with a well-focused microwave beam. So the space-based solar power idea is put the solar cells where they work well, put them out in space, then send the power down to where you want to use it. You can take the power from perhaps a microwave beam, perhaps a laser beam, and convert it at the ground using a rectenna and make baseload power for the ground. But there's a lot of technical problems that end up having to be solved. Now the physics problems, we can solve those. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with the laws of physics. We know how to make power in space. We know how to beam power. We know how to convert it. But there's a lot of the technologies that are going to need work. So I wouldn't expect this for the next couple of years, wouldn't expect it probably in a decade, but in the long term, it's a technology that we think we understand. Uh, it's gonna make sense if we're going to make gigawatts of power. Uh, perhaps we should put the solar arrays where they're most efficiently used. Speaking of the size of a, of a craft like that mm -hmm. out in space, how, how big would, would a space-based solar panel need to be to really generate the type of energies that we're talking about? Well, if we're going to supply the whole Earth, we need a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So we're talking big solar arrays. We're talking solar arrays that are perhaps five miles on an edge. Wow. Uh, they're the size of small cities. Yeah. Uh, but the advantage is once you have something that's this big in space, it produces many gigawatts of power and does it continuously. Certainly you'd want to do the assembly out in space. You yeah. can't make something so big uh, we could either use astronauts to put them together, and that would be my preference. Mm -hmm. I think that human beings belong in space. Yeah. We should be out there doing work. But the other possibility is robots. Robot technology is getting better and better. The robots are getting better, whereas the humans are staying about the same. Yeah. So it's very likely that if we built such a, a large structure in space, we'll end up doing it with robots. Perhaps it will be humans controlling the robots. Maybe they'd be what we call telerobots, where the human is on the ground and the robot is doing what the human instructs it to do. Mm -hmm. And that might be the best of all, where we have a fusion. It's not really entirely robots, but it's not entirely astronauts. It's both robots mm -hmm. and humans working together. And the nice thing about the robot is that all of the operations that are very repetitive, you can just program it to do it without even really stopping to think about it. Pure robots are very good at repetitive action, mm -hmm. which means assembly line type manufacture. Understood.
in the long term, we'd really want to make these things not out of stuff launched off from the Earth, but we'd want to make it out of resources already in space. Mm. And space is just full of resources if we know how to use them and how to find them and how to refine them. But we could certainly imagine perhaps using materials mined from the moon or materials mined from the asteroids and refining out the silicon, making solar cells, and refining out the metal oxides that we use to make glass, mm -hmm. and then refining titanium and steel and aluminum for the structural members. We could probably make these solar cells entirely out of materials we find in space, yeah. so we don't have to launch them at all. Yeah. It's all made from stuff that's out there that we bring in toward the Earth. Ultimately, we have to get away from coal-fired plants. We have to stop using fossil fuels because there's only so much fossil fuel available and there's only so much oxygen in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We can't convert it all to carbon dioxide. So solar is a great technology because it's so easy to distribute. Mm -hmm. Uh, it really is an ultimate distributed source that you can put solar cells everywhere. There's other technologies that you could think about using. Uh, you could certainly think about nuclear power. There is advantages to nuclear power. There's disadvantages to nuclear power. Nuclear power plants tend to be much more concentrated power. You want to make us a, a plant that makes hundreds of megawatts or gigawatts of power if you're going to do a nuclear plant. So it's sort of radically the opposite of the solar. Solar is distributed, you put them everywhere. Yeah. A uh, nuclear power plant is concentrated, you put them where you want a lot of power. In the future, it would be a tremendous advantage to us if we can learn to harness fusion energy mm -hmm. and make power out of fusing hydrogen. Once we can do this, our power source is the deuterium in the world's ocean. Yeah. There is a tremendous amount of deuterium. We will solve all of our power problems. Right now, we don't know how to do this. Right now, there's been experiments with magnetic confinement fusion, with impact fusion, with laser confinement. But right now, we don't know how to get more power out of the, the fusion process than it takes to make the fusion start. Understood. But it's under a lot of study, and it would certainly be a, a great technology if we can get it to work. The old joke about fusion technology is that it's 50 years in the future and always has been and always will be. Yeah. So there's a lot of technology that we need to do. We're getting just to the point that we can make these reactions break even, but it's a long way from just demonstrating reaction in a laboratory reactor to making economical power. So I'm not sure if I can predict how long it'll be, but I'd say uh, still 50 still years 50 is probably years. Still, a, still a good estimate. And certainly I'd love to see solar panels on all of our cars. Yeah. Uh, among other things, when I park out in the sun, uh, I hate the fact that my car gets hot yeah. and there's kilowatts of solar energy hitting it that I could be using yeah. to charge my battery, to run my air conditioner, and why is it just being wasted heating up my car? Yeah. So certainly augmenting power on cars uh, with solar panels is a great idea. We're gonna see that in the next couple of years. I bet in 10 years, every car will have solar panels on it just for that, uh, augmenting the electrical power use. I think ultimately the politics are going to become irrelevant because it's all going to be about economics. I think as solar energy gets cheaper and cheaper, and that's the trend that's been happening, it will be cheap enough that it will simply make sense. You won't be saying, oh, should we do solar or coal? But you'll say, well, let's do what's cheap. Yeah. And when that gets to be solar, it's gonna be used a lot. The question that we have in terms of politics is a question actually of pricing. When people start saying, well, I'm putting solar on my house, uh, can I sell solar energy back to the utility? Mm. Now you have the question, well, how much should the utility pay? And utilities are all regulated. Yeah. So that becomes a political question. Uh, how much should the utilities pay if you're, you're generating? So you're not buying energy from yeah. the utility anymore. You buy it sometimes and sell it sometimes. So you're doing your own transaction. 
And that's a political question. It's a valid question for politics. Another question is, should people pay different rates for energy generated in the daytime and the nighttime? Mm -hmm. Right now, energy generated at the nighttime is cheap. Yeah. The power plants are all idle because not a whole lot of people use energy at 2 a.m. So maybe they should be selling that energy cheap. Yeah. So if that's true, they should be selling the energy during the daytime, during the peak rate, which is 2 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe they should be paying more for that. And that would be a boost for solar energy because solar produces most power when the sun is shining, when people are running their air conditioners. So there are some political questions here. But in the long run, it's a question of economics. Mm -hmm. We need to make power systems that make economic sense. Uh, when we talk about appropriate technology, we mean what's appropriate to the society and the economics. What makes sense? And when solar makes sense, we'll be using it. How far away do you think we are realistically from the point where it makes sense? Well, we're there now for a lot of markets. Okay. If you're not right on the electric grid and you're in a place that has sun, right now solar makes sense. So it's not a question of all of a sudden there will be a day when we say, oh, the price went to 50 cents a watt, mm -hmm. now everybody changes to solar. But it starts out in the best places, maybe the southwest, maybe Arizona, Southern California, where electric rates are high and there's a lot of sunlight. And then as solar gets cheaper and cheaper, it expands out to places that have a little bit less sunlight then expands further north. So it's a, it's a process that's already begun. It's already started that you're seeing economic generation of solar energy. And just as the economics get better and better, uh, it expands out to more and more places where solar makes sense. What, from your perspective, is the greatest threat currently facing humanity? Humans' tendency toward war is always something to worry about. As we keep learning more and more technologies, there's always somebody saying, well, how can we use that technology in warfare? Mm -hmm. I think we've come through the 60s. <laughs> we <laughs> lived through the era of mutual assured destruction, mm -hmm. so I'm optimistic. But there's always a, a question of war. If we can avoid war, we do ultimately have to worry about overpopulation. The Earth can't sustain an infinite amount of people, and the population has been growing. But even there, I'm a little optimistic. The population hasn't been growing as much as people predicted in the 60s that it would. Mm -hmm. People have been learning to be a little bit more moderate. There are three things that we know of that lead to lower population growth, smaller mm -hmm. families. One of them is as people get richer, as they get more prosperous, they have fewer children. Another thing is as people get more educated, they have fewer children. And the third thing, interestingly, is sort of the silliest one, but if people have access to birth control technology, mm -hmm. you don't even have to force them to use it. You don't, coercion isn't needed. If you just give people access to birth control technology, they have fewer children. So my solution to that is we need to make the world more prosperous. Mm -hmm. We need to make the world more educated and we need to give people access to technology. So that's my solution to the world's problems. Absolutely. <laughs> let's get rich, let's get prosperous, let's get educated. In your opinion, do you feel that everything will be all right? My opinion is there are a lot of problems. You really can't deny it. There's problems that we face, there's problems showing up in the future, but here's the thing, there's always been problems. I'm happy I didn't live in the time of the Black Death. The plague of fascism across Europe came and it was conquered. Mm -hmm. The mutual assured destruction of my youth, it's over. We're not really facing each other with 20,000 nuclear warheads. So I'm optimistic because in the sense of history, we have solved our problems. There's problems that are facing us and they're tough problems, but we face tough problems before and come through. So I think one way or another, we can muddle through. We can, we can make it into the future.
Currently, solar panels and electric cars appear to be available only to those who can pay a premium. But as Dr. Landis says, every year efficiencies go up and cost goes down. By the end of this decade, Tesla Motors will release a sub $30,000 electric car. You'll be able to take that car to any Tesla refueling station which is powered by the sun. It will cost you nothing. In my opinion, this event will precipitate a move towards a world with clean, abundant energy, relegating carbon fuels to the past.